Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my voice clear for everybody here? Yes. Okay, uh, good. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Bandar Al Kahtani. Uh, I'm a consultant in neuro ophthalmology and uh, executive director of uh, Jeddah Eye Specialist Hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Uh, today, uh, First of all, I would like to, to also thank and welcome all my speakers, colleagues, uh, and uh, for joining and for sharing us this unique uh, meeting. Uh, I would like also to thank and welcome uh, uh, all the listeners and attendees for sharing us uh, this uh, good meeting. I hope to be very informative for them. Uh, uh, there will be a... Uh, 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 we, today, uh, this webinar uh, will be about uh, and will focus on uh, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy, uh, which is uh, uh, first, which was first described uh, and uh, uh, diagnosed as a distinctive clinical entity in 1871 by the German ophthalmologist. At that time, his name is Theodor uh, Leber. Uh, Theodor Leper lived between 1817 and, uh, 1840 and 1917. Uh, he described uh, a characteristic pattern of visual loss among members of uh, four families, and his observations were subsequently confirmed in uh, pedigrees from different populations. Uh, actually, uh, this disease pattern of inheritance was uh, to remain a mystery. Uh, until more became known about the mitochondrial genome. Uh, the hypothesis that the mitochondrial DNA mutation was the causative factor then later on was established. Um, Leber's hereditary mito, uh, optic neuropathy is a mitochondrial disease uh, and it is considered as the most common uh, uh, inherited mitochondrial disorder. Uh, uh, but in the same time, it's a very rare uh, disorder. Uh, its prevalence is about one in 30,000 and uh, to one in 50,000 of the whole general population. Uh, uh, okay, today, uh, now we're gonna start uh, uh, our uh, meeting with uh, uh, the first speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Raid Al-Bahbahani. Uh, actually, Dr. Raid Al Bahbahani is a consultant uh, ophthalmologist, neuro ophthalmologist, oculoplastic, and orbital surgeon in uh, Al Bahar Ophthalmology Center. He did his residency in ophthalmology in Dalhousie University, Halifax, Canada, and uh, his fellowship was in neuro ophthalmology, oculoplastic surgery at Wills Eye Hospital in. Uh, Philadelphia, United States of America. Uh, I'm very proud to introduce to you, Dr. Zaid. Uh, now you can uh, uh, join, uh, uh, start your presentation and that time with you now. Thank you, Dr. al Gahtani, for this kind introduction. So I'm gonna start sharing my slides. <clears throat> Okay. So I have no financial interest to disclose. And uh, Dr. al Gahtani already talked about her, the history and uh, how labor's hereditary optic neuropathy was de defined as a distinctive disorder. And it wasn't until recently, 1988, when the uh, mutation was uh, was uh, found and characterized, the 11778 mitochondrial mutation, which accounts for the majority of uh, the mutations of labors. So I'm not an ocular uh, geneticist, but if you look at this typical tree of uh, a family with labors optic neuropathy, you will notice a few things. One of it is that most most of the affected uh, uh, probands are males, and that um, females tend to be carriers of the disease. They don't necessarily manifest the uh, disease. The other thing that you'll notice is that uh, there is a variance in the phenotypic expression in terms that you have people with the disease, with the disease 
and people who have the mutation, but they don't necessarily manifest the disease. And if you look at the mitochondrial genome, this is a picture of the uh, circular arrangement of the mitochondrial genome. And you notice that the mitochondria has only 37 genes, which is uh, by no means not sufficient to produce most of the proteins required for mitochondrial function. Therefore, the majority of the mitochondrial proteins are actually encoded by the nucleus, not the mitochondria, and they are transported from the nucleus uh, uh, into the mitochondria. In that sense, even diseases such as autosomal dominant optic neuropathy, which is considered due to mitochondrial, uh, due to nuclear gene mutation, can uh, manifest as a result of mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, loss of retinal ganglion cells leading to visual loss. And the three primary mutations of labors, uh, which account for 90% of the uh, uh, disease are the 11778, which is the most common mutation. And we have the 14484, which is uh, the one that has probably the most favorable uh, visual uh, prognosis, and the 3460, which has the highest penetrance. All these mutations affect the uh, complex one of the uh, oxidative, oxidative phosphorylation uh, pathway, and they affect the protein subunits of, of complex one. Now, you will have other mutations, uh, 5 to 10 percent, due to other rare uh, forms of mutation that also affect uh, complex one. And just to introduce uh, the concept of homoplasmy and heteroplasmy now, uh, with cell division, you get a random segregation of uh, mitochondrial DNA. And sometimes you get normal homoplasmy of a normal mitochondrial gene. And you can get a, a condition of heteroplasmy in which you have mixture of a wild type or a normal form of mitochondrial gene and mutant uh, mitochondrial uh, uh, DNA. And this percentage can vary from 30, 70% is probably the, the threshold at which you may start manifest disease if you have heteroplasmy of 70%. However, majority of uh, labors, hereditary optic neuropathy are due to homoplasmy mutation. And that is you have 100% uh, mutant mitochondrial DNA. So if you have homoplasmy, you have mitochondrial DNA, which is mutant, uh, at least one mutation in all mitochondria. However, not all homoplasmic individuals uh, will necessarily manifest labors. And we're gonna talk about that because as we said, the disease has a variable penetrance. And condition of heteroplasmy is when you have a pathogenic labor causing a mutation in mixture with a normal uh, mitochondrial DNA. Now, in five to 10% of the time, uh, these patients may manifest labor. And as we said, the threshold for penetrance uh, is if you have heteroplasmy of about 60 to 70%. However, the majority of patients with heteroplasmy, they don't exhibit my, uh, the disease and they're probably, they don't warrant uh, preclinical uh, testing or screening. So what makes uh, the uh, phenotypic expression of labor so variable? Well, there are ver a variety of factors. So we have genetic factors, we have gender factors, we have environmental factors, and we have uh, factors relating to the haplotype, haplogroup, and uh, anatomical factors. So genetic factors, whether mitochondrial or nuclear, uh, it's probably that uh, some labor carriers may have mutant uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA copy number uh, upregulated by uh, a range of uh, mechanisms. So uh, additional mutations, if you have a concurrent mutation, that could have a synergistic effect on phenotypic expression. And if you have a condition where you have uh, non-pathogenic mutations, the condition so-called as uh, known as polymorphism, uh, this sometimes can be enough to cause clinical uh, labors hereditary optic neuropathy. And we already have said that uh, the majority of mitochondrial protein are actually encoded by the nucleus. So you can get nuclear gene mutations 
uh, causing mitochondrial dysfunction. What about gender? We know that uh, labor is more common in males. Uh, it's not as uh, females can get the disease too. It's probably more commonly than uh, previously thought, ac according to some recent uh, publications. So the, the reason why females, uh, they don't manifest disease may be due to uh, endocrinological effects, uh, estrogen, somehow upregulating uh, mitochondrial mitobiogenesis uh, and increasing the number of mitochondria. Uh, there may be other X-linked nuclear modifiers, so-called prickle 3 which is a protein linked to increase uh, uh, biogenesis of ATPase. So um, this may explain why uh, labor is more common in males compared to females. Uh, we've seen that the, the three primary mutations are commonly associated with the haplogroup J, which is a Eurasian uh, haplogroup. And this particular haplogroup is also associated with increased susceptibility to, susceptibility to toxins such as tobacco and alcohol. And we have found some mutation associated also with another haplogroup, haplogroup L3, which has an or, east, uh, uh, origin in, in East Africa. So what about environmental factors? Uh, smoking, for sure, alcohol consumption had been uh, associated by uh, uh, associated with the decompensation and the manifestation of the disease. In other words, you can get you can, you are genetically susceptible if you have the mutation and if you have if you uh, introduce a toxin, then you um, decompensate and start manifesting the disease. And there is some evidence also that the visual outcomes actually can be worse in, pe in people who are exposed uh, to these toxins in a dose dependent fashion. We have some antibiotics such as linozolid, etambutol, and chloramphenicol, which might interfere with mitochondrial uh, function and uh, act as uh, precipitants of the uh, disease. Uh, there are also anatomical factors. So um, people have found that if you have a large cup to disc uh, 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 diameter, so people who have large, uh, large uh, uh, vertical, they have a large vertical disc diameter actually tend to do better than people who have a small uh, vertical uh, disc diameter. Uh, this is similar to situation, uh, if you, analogy to uh, people, for example, who have non arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, and it's probably due to the crowding of the axons if you have a smaller uh, vertical disc diameter. So if you have a large uh, vertical disc diameter, this actually might be protective against uh, Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy or against the expression of the Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. So why the eye and the optic nerve? Uh, we know that Labor's preferentially affects the macular papillar bundle. And uh, these are uh, the smallest of axon, which are unmyelinated and they require high energy demands. And they are probably more uh, susceptible uh, to uh, low energy supply status. And because of the uh, size of the axons, also their ability to accommodate mitochondria is reduced because of the small, small volume, which makes them more susceptible um, to, uh, to injury and labors hereditary optic neuropathy. So if you look at uh, the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, we will see that there are five complexes and uh, uh, the protons are pumped from complex one to complex two. And we have the uh, NADH dehydrogenase, which is comp composed of several subunits. And uh, what happens is that NADH and FADH2 uh, donate their electrons. And this releases energy required to uh, convert ADP into ATP. And we have already said that the site of the mutation is uh, at complex one. So if you look at the pathway and you see that we have complex one and complex two, and uh, even though that complex one is uh, affected by the mutation, it's, it's relatively uh, a, minor, uh, a minor thing in the pathway because you can have uh, complex two acting at the same way. So why is that uh, people, uh, why is that, interference with this step 
would would lead to uh, uh, Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. And uh, the other uh, uh, explanation is that you get buildup of reactive oxygen species because of the failure of this step. And this has its own detrimental effects as you as we will see later on. So the reactive oxygen species are because of the failure of transport of electrons from complex one to complex two, reactive oxygen species are released. This somehow alters the uh, electron potential of the cell and will invite all kinds of uh, bad chemicals and activate pathways which are responsible for apoptosis and death of the retinal ganglion cell. And this has been shown in, in animal models that if you have reactive oxygen species, uh, this would uh, uh, release not only, uh, this would not necessarily diminish ATP production, but it would also uh, lead to labor's hereditary optic neuropathy because of the buildup of reacting oxygen species. And this is just a, a, a schematic picture showing you complex one. So here you have complex one uh, defective because of the mutation, you get buildup of reacting oxygen species. This would cause uh, mitochondrial strain reduced ATP, increased reoxygen, oxygen, oxygen species, that would uh, activate different pathways, which uh, would lead to apoptosis of the retinal ganglion cell. And here you also uh, have the effect of the tobacco, um, ethanol, and all kinds of toxins as well. And uh, this is what the idea behind using a uh, uh, idabinone is that it basically improves the shuttling or transport of electrons from complex one to complex two and also act as a free radical scavenger against reactive oxygen species. Uh, this is a, a picture uh, uh, courtesy of Dr. Barboni from Italy and it's just showing you the uh, evolution of the disease. So here you have, uh, first you have swelling of the temple uh, papillomacular bundle fibers, and then you have the superior and then nasal, and then uh, it's, sh it's showing you here with the OCT, the death of the retinal ganglion cell, and also the mic microangiopathy that develops uh, during the evolution of the uh, disease. And this is a, another picture, uh, courtesy of Dr. Alfredo Sadun, he sent me this picture. So we have uh, these, uh, the brown stain shows you the viable fibers. So you can see what happens with labor is that the, the temporal fibers are gone first. So the macular papillary bundle, and then you have loss of the inferior and then the nasal uh, fibers die last. So this is just a summary of, uh, of, the, of what, I've said, what I've talked about basically. So we said that uh, there are genetic factors, there are factors that modify the phenotypic expression of the disease, and these can be genetic or environmental. And complex one deficiency by itself would lead to ATP synthesis, but this is not enough to uh, labors, for labors to manifest. Uh, emphasize the role of reactive oxygen species and the activation of the uh, pathways that will ultimately lead to the death of the retinal ganglion cell and optic nerve degeneration. So uh, this is all I had to say. Thank you very much, Dr. Raik, for this uh, very informative and uh, deep information about genetics and pathophysiology of uh, Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, uh, regarding any question, regarding any uh, thing to be discussed by any of one of the attendees he wants to ask any question, he can send it in the chat and we're going to uh, discuss it and answer it at the end of the meeting. Uh, I hope uh, 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 everybody uh, has a question or anything to what he wants to discuss. He can send this question to the chat and we're gonna discuss it at the end of the meeting. Uh, the second presentation now uh, is gonna be by Dr. Uh, Luai Edwake. Dr. Edwake is a staff physician in a Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi. Uh, uh, he has done fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at Harvard Medical School 
Boston, Massachusetts, United States, and a fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology at the University of Minnesota, uh, United States. Dr. Dweck has a special interest in a comprehensive pediatric ophthalmology, pediatric and adult strabismus, and a variety of neuro-ophthalmic disorders, including double vision optic neuropathies, facial spasm, and pseudotumor cerebri. Welcome, Dr. Luai, waiting for your uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fahtani. Uh, I hope you can hear me clear. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Babahani, for this uh, great insight uh, about genetics and pathophysiology. Uh, so over the next 15 minutes, I'll take you into a journey into different clinical case scenarios for patients who I've seen personally and uh, happen to have LHON. Uh, these are my disclosures. And... Uh, I'll start with asking some questions to our audience. I'll give 10 seconds or maybe five seconds pause after each question. Uh, this one is easy since Dr. Babani also already mentioned that in his presentation. So what is the male to female ratio in LH2N? Next question is, LH2N is very unlikely to develop in the following age group. And the last question, what is the most common visual field defect associated with LHON? So hopefully over the next um, 15 minutes, uh, you'll be able to answer all these questions. Uh, this is the outline for my presentation. I'll start with presenting a typical patient uh, with LHN, moving forward to demographics, clinical and clinical findings, and finally end up with various clinical scenarios where LHON was not on top of the differential diagnosis. Uh, so let me start with the first case. This is a 22-year-old male patient who presented with decreased vision in both eyes. And here is the story. The patient says that two months ago, he noticed that his vision got foggy in the left eye. And uh, a few weeks later, he developed the same symptoms in the other eye. So both eyes affected within a few weeks interval. Uh, going back into the history, uh, he has a history, no significant past medical history, but he's a social history. He's a heavy smoker for five years. He doesn't uh, um, um, intake alcohol and he has a normal diet. Uh, family history has unknown, un, uh, his maternal uncle lost vision at younger age with unknown reason. So let's go to the examination. This is his examination. So 2080 vision in the right eye, 2060 vision in the left eye. As you can see, he missed some color plates in both eyes, no afferent pupillary defect. The rest of the anterior segment exam was unremarkable. This is his fundus photos. And the first thing that comes um, when you look at these uh, discs is the, the color. Um, they look abnormally red, hyperemic, and uh, I wish you can see, but there are some areas of telangiectasia around the temporal aspect of the uh, optic nerves on both sides. So these abnormally colored or abnormally hyperemic optic discs raised the question about the differential diagnosis. Let's move on. This is his visual field. And um, as you can see, bilateral centrocecal scotoma. And let's move on. This is the OCT of the optic nerve. Let me just, just Look at the red free images. You can see there is some area of um, blurriness along the upper uh, margin of the optic nerve in the right eye. And you can see it here uh, along the nerve fiber layer thickness, some thickening in the right eye, the, the eye that is most recently affected. When the left eye, the machine is telling me there is already some thinning, but it's very mild as you can see. And now I was going to share with you one of the studies that I've been using it more and more in my clinic. And this is the ganglion cell map, um, the Spectratus machine. And uh, again, I have, no different, I have no disclosure about this machine, but I use it very often for my patients. It get, just can segment the ganglion cell uh, um, uh, in the macula. And as you can see in the prior picture, there was no thinning, but here the patient lost significant amount of the ganglion cell layer already. So that tells you that the changes in the ganglion cell layer, in the macula happens prior to the changes that you would observe in the written nerve fiber layer. And I, I, we see this in different forms of optic neuropathies. So at this point, what is your, the differential diagnosis? 
this is a list, not necessarily all will apply to this patient, but this is when I see bilateral uh, uh, optic neuropathy with no known trigger, um, no history of pain, no history of um, um, trauma, or no history of even uh, 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 brain tumors or headaches. So, uh, so hereditary optic neuropathy comes on top of the differential diagnosis, but this is the rest of the differential diagnosis. This is what I do usually, not necessarily applies for all of the patients, but I check their vitamins. Um, and uh, again, I will check, uh, send them for uh, LHON testing. I order a brain MRI and orbital MRI. The reason I ordered the orbital MRI because I need the post uh, um, contrast fat saturation of the orbits. And usually the brain MRI does not give you this, these cuts. Um, so this patient had happened to have normal brain MRI, normal uh, orbital MRI, and the genetic testing confirmed the diagnosis. We started him on Andibanon, and this is the clinical course. So over time, although he was already on the Andibanon, he developed some thinning in both eyes, but it was stable. And his uh, final visual acuity, which I, I believe for this patient was about 16 or 18 months since the diagnosis is 2100 in the right eye, 2150 in the left eye. This is a typical clinical diagnosis of LHON. Um, I think the time when you do the genetic testing is that you want to look for what kind of mutation, but the, all the story goes with LHON. So in summary, so you have a young male with sequential bilateral painless vision loss, um, they are, were exposed to a trigger factor, which should happen for this patient to be smoking, and they have these elements in the eye exam. These are very important because sometimes, this is the typical presentation, but sometimes some of these will be missing. Um, so let's go on and describe or uh, focus more on the demographics and the findings. And I know uh, Dr. Uh, Rustam will focus more and will tell us more about the uh, uh, the findings, the clinical findings. Uh, this is actually from a paper by Dr. Uh, Rustum, um, and it shows the demographics. And what I just want to show in this graph, uh, the upper graph, is that the peak of this disease, uh, somewhere in males start around the age of 15, goes up to 26. According to this uh, large demographic study that published in 2020, while in females, you have this answer, start upon it across all ages. It's exactly the same. Interestingly, 10% of these patients who develop LHN develop it after the age of 50. Uh, finally, the median age is slightly, in, in females, they tend to be older than males. So this is just to keep in mind. And then going forward to, I'm sorry, I'm frozen. Yep, uh, I hope you can see now. Okay, uh, so, um, this is the pie chart showing the distribution. And as you know, and Dr. Babani already uh, mentioned, it's three to one. And this is against what at least I've learned during my residency. I think I was told that a long time ago, it was 10 to one, then five to one, and now it's three to one. Actually, in certain age groups, it can, can go up to one to one. And uh, we didn't know that uh, before the study. I, it, it wouldn't um, come to my mind to think that it can be one to one. Uh, female to male ratio or male to female ratio. Um, next slide, yeah. And this is just to slide to share with you the progression of the vision loss. So you have the drop in vision very quickly during the first few months, but as you can see that the drop continues over time. So it's not just the acute stage of the disease that the, 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 the loss of vision continues. And this is exactly what happened with our patient. And this raises a question about for how long you want to keep these patients on treatment. The second thing is the interval between the involvement of both eyes. This is a bilateral disease in most cases, uh, uh, but the interval classically is weeks to, to months, but it can extend to up to years. And, uh, I'm not going to comment on that because I'm sure Dr. Uh, Rustam will say, will say a lot about it, but this is the various uh, uh, optic disc findings that can be seen in patients with LHON. Um, uh, actually, Dr. Luai, it's, uh, it's not shown. It's almost uh, freezing here. So where, where did we stop? Uh, LHON presentation, median age at the onset. Well, the, okay. The, yeah. Okay, let me see. Years, so I think there is a... Yeah, I think there is a glitch. I can see it. Uh, yeah, but now it's frozen. Okay, let me just stop this uh, pen. 
marker, maybe it slowed things down. Okay, can you hear me? And uh, let's move on. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. okay now. Okay, so these are the findings that uh, of the optic nerve that uh, uh, can be seen in patients with LHUN. And um, again, as, as I said, Dr. Rustam will tell us more about this and we can discuss it later on. Uh, these are the, this is the progression, the typical progression for patients with LHUN. And as you can see here, uh, the, it starts with the central or circocentral scotoma, but eventually it pr progressed to altitudinal or maybe diffuse scotoma um, every, over a few months. Um, the typical MRI for these patients is unremarkable. You do a brain MRI, it doesn't show anything. You do orbital MRI, it doesn't show any enhancement or anything. But actually, um, this does not apply to all of the patients. Uh, some MRI findings has been described for patients with LHN. And um, um, it can be with the T2 hyperintensity. The two white arrows are pointing at two uh, small white lines in the middle of the prechrismatic optic nerve. It's a hyperintensity signal um, of the optic nerves. And this, can be, uh, this has been described in a few patients with LHN. The chiasma thickening in the, uh, in the MRI in the middle. And the last pictures on the right uh, shows MRI um, finding that it is a very, um, very uh, um, surprising that some patients have enhancement of the optic nerve. I haven't, I haven't seen it before in my patients, but it would confuse, uh, I think, in many physicians when they see patients, especially now we know about the uh, optic neuritis, MOG, which can present with bilateral optic nerve enhancement. So this might, might um, uh, confuse patients, uh, physicians when they treat patients with LH1. So next uh, thing now, it's I'm going to discuss various case scenarios. Um, so this is the second patient, this is a 35 year old female patient with bilateral vision loss, sorry, with vision loss in the right eye for two days. She was actually referred from neurology for treatment uh, for optic neuritis. Since she had a history of optic neuritis in the other eyes two years ago, in the other eye two years ago. So presented new onset of, pain, of painless vision loss and history of optic neuritis in the other eye. She has already history of MS, and history of smoking. Um, let's move on. This is the left eye is the affected eye, the old, the eye that has been affected a long time ago. So it has 2,800 vision. Well, the, the right eye is the eye that she came complaining of and has, she has a 2050 vision. Um, she has a left APD and let's move on. This is her, um, what do you expect in patients with this story? Uh, she has some um, swelling of the optic nerve in the right eye, and you, have, you can see the optic atrophy in the left eye. The visual field show this typical central scotoma, and let's move on to the MRI. So the MRI was of the orbit, and I'm saying, I'm talking about the orbit was clear. Typically, this patient has the MS lesions, but the MRI did not show the enhancement yet that you would expect in patients with uh, optic neuritis. So the story, the, this raises a lot of questions. Why is it painless? Why, it is, why the other eye is severely de has decreased vision? And you wouldn't expect that with patients with MS. And, and the, uh, the absence of normal uh, MRI, oh, sorry, the MRI enhancement uh, with optic neuritis. So this raises the big question, is this optic neuritis? And the answer was no. This patient was found to have LHON. This brings the next slide, which is, Whatever, if you think it's a coincidence or, um, or influence or a true associated, but we know that there is a, 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 a clinical phenotype distinct from both LHON and MS and describe that with LHON with MS. These patients tend to be older. The female to male ratio is uh, two to one and the interval can go up to 17 years. And these are the findings that may uh, tell you this patient might not have optic neuritis. The next slide is as the uh, next patient is a seven year old girl presented with decreased vision in both eyes. She was diagnosed with psychogenic vision loss. And uh, um, nothing about the history except that she's a professional slime maker. So we don't know if this is again a coincidence or maybe this is the trigger in her story, but this is her vision 2100 in both eyes, bilateral dyschromatopsia. Um, no after pupillary defect, and these are her optic nerves. She has lost um, some of the temporal fibers already. Again, the thinning, 
and the GCL map again diffuse loss of the ganglion cell. Uh, the same workup that I do for these patients and including the MRI of the brain in the orbit and came clear and the genetic testing, testing confirmed the diagnosis. Uh, uh, just to mention that these patients, we usually ask the family to come, uh, the mom especially uh, uh, for uh, clinical evaluation. Sometimes we send them for cardiac evaluation, looking for other associations. Um, but we, we're, uh, we're lucky to find that one of the siblings has these optic nerves and uh, had genetic testing who, which confirmed that he also has the same mutation. So pediatric onset LOHN, it, uh, it, it compromises about 80%, 8% of the affected patients. And as I mentioned, the male to female ratio goes up to one to one in patients less than five years. You need to look for um, neurological and cardiac associations. Uh, we're short in time, so I will uh, move quickly to the last case. This is a very sad story of a patient who is a 26-year-old um, man who was diagnosed with IAH uh, based on um, a borderline optic nerve, uh, sorry, uh, lumbar puncture, and was treated with Dermox and later had a VP shunt. Uh, um, so nothing in the history he has a normal BMI and uh, a family history, uh, sorry, a social history that he's a heavy smoker. Um, so this is his vision in both eyes, and we were lucky that he shared with us, this is his optic nerve at presentation. I don't think these are maximally, uh, severely swollen optic nerves. I don't usually use optos to, uh, to uh, describe the optic nerve or, or to, uh, uh, to judge the optic nerves, but this is how it looks like in the photos that he brought with him. But at the time of the presentation, he already developed optic atrophy. The MRI findings in his case were not really uh, showing what you would expect for patients with IAH. Finally, if we look at the modified dandy criteria for IAH, he did not meet any of these criteria, any of these. It's only the optic nerve swelling and the decreased vision. This patient ended up with VP shunt or a different diagnosis. Just to highlight the use of FFA in these patients that doesn't show the, uh, if you feel that some patients, you know, with LHN have the pseudo swelling, the pseudo papilledema, and uh, the FFA can be used to look for the late leakage, and we use it in this patient. So this patient was found to have LHN, not IAH. Um, these are my take home messages, and this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Luai, for this very, very, very nice presentation. Uh, now we are going to the next presentation, which is going to be by Dr. Rustum Karangia. Dr. Rustum Kar Karangia is a neuro-ophthalmologist at the University of Ottawa Eye Institute. He completed his medical uh, training and PhD in Canada and the Neuro-Ophthalmology Fellowship in UCLA with Dr. Alfredi, uh, Alfredo Esadon, uh, world's expert in labor hereditary optic neuropathy. His research interests include objective outcome measures in ocular disease, and he is involved in multiple clinical trials in LHON. He is a board member of LHON Canada and scientific and medical advisory board member for the uh, for the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation and the International Foundation of Optic Nerve Diseases. He is currently an assistant professor and vice chair at the University of Ottawa and holds the JR Clinical Research Chair Fellowship for Ophthalmology. Welcome, Dr. Rostum. Thank you very you. much. Thank you for having me. And... Uh, begin my presentation. So I've been asked to talk about a few things and there will be a little bit of overlap with some of the things that we've already heard that have been so wonderfully being uh, presented. Uh, I do want to start off though by saying that as I have been involved in a lot of labor's research, I do have some conflicts of interest as I've been involved in clinical trials. Um, I'm an equal opportunity conflicts of interest in the sense that I've been involved in pretty well all of the clinical trials that have been taking place in the last uh, number of years. Uh, I have also received uh, research uh, funding from several organizations, including UMDF, LHON.org, as well as iFund. 
So we've already heard that Labors was originally described in 1858 by von Grafe, but it is named after Theodore Labor, who, as we heard, described four sets of families. And he described a clinical phenotype. And that phenotype is what we talk about when we talk about patients with labors. We've advanced beyond the phenotypes now where we start to talk about genetics and we talk about how the genetic influences of different diseases are linked to a specific gene. And labors is a little bit different from that in the sense that you end up with this pattern of vision loss that we've heard about, this pattern of central scotomas that we've heard about, this pattern of painless sequential vision loss that we've heard about that is a phenotype. It's not a genetic direct link. And we know that there's certain genes that are involved, but as we'll hear, there's several genes that are involved and understanding that and appreciating how this interplay between different mitochondrial diseases is important. So Labor's original manuscript described the four families who had abrupt vision loss in both eyes, simultaneously or sequentially, optic atrophy, and it happened all in young men. And so labors is somewhat unique, right? Because you've got a disease where people can go their entire life as a carrier. They can hold this mitochondrial um, gene defect. They end up living their entire life. They have no vision loss. They have perfectly normal vision for their entire life. However, for some reason, some individuals are carriers. And then at some point in their life, we've heard about their exposure to toxins, we eat smoke, uh, alcohol, or other issues, and they convert. They lose vision. And subsequently, they become affected. And it's this conversion that we're going to be talking about today and understanding some of the features clinically that we've already heard about, but some of the all the subtleties and overlap between the conversion and the um, uh, affected patients with labors. So the features that we've already heard about is a profound loss of color vision. We know that these patients get central visual field defects. We know that they also lose papular macular bundle. And we also have heard that the, you end up with temporal loss of the uh, optic nerve. And this is typically symmetrical. Well, labor talks about the loss of color vision. And we can understand this because any patient, including our optic neuritis patients, have 1.2 million fibers in their optic nerve. And when they end up with an attack of optic neuritis, they end up losing some of those fibers. And so these fibers aren't needed to see 2020. How many of your optic neuritis patients come back to see you and they're seeing 2020 on the eye chart and they still complain to you bitterly saying that I still don't see right. It's not the way I was seeing before I had the attack of optic neuritis. And we know from glaucoma, you can end up losing 50% almost of your nerve fiber layer and you still see 2020. Our Snell and visual acuity charts are black on what? High contrast. And so you need the rest of the fibers that are there to be able to see color. You need the rest of the fibers that are there to be able to see contrast. So some of the first features that these patients sometimes complain about is that one of their eyes, when they were looking at the traffic lights or when they were looking at a stop sign, the red didn't look right. That color starts to shift and it starts to change. And that's usually one of the first features that patients notice. It's also quite common for patients not to notice anything until the second eye is involved. Because if you think about it, if your non-dominant eye is affected, you can function with your dominant eye for a long period of time before you accidentally cover your dominant eye and realize, wait, I'm not seeing so well from my other eye. So the whole question of whether or not it's simultaneous or sequential can be debated depending on the patient. Labor also said that you end up with optic atrophy. And as we've heard already, there are actually subtle changes that happen at the time of conversion prior to you obtaining optic atrophy. And Dr. Sajun, one of my mentors, has been the one who's highlighted the fact that we have some pseudoedema that takes place around the optic nerve. Now, it's typically in the inferior temporal quadrant, and he's shown very eloquently in those pathological sites you saw, saw earlier, where you've got loss of the nerve fiber layer that begins in that inferior temporal quadrant and then progresses superior nasally. And the reason for that is the size of the fibers that are present in those particular areas. The papular macular bundle fibers are the thinnest fibers of all of the fibers around in the optic nerve. And so you have a preferential loss for these thin fibers because they don't have presumably the ability to compensate by increasing the uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, increasing the mitochondrial uh, number inside the cells because they're physically constricted by the size of the cell. 
In addition to that, the inferior temporal quadrant also has a very similar issue as well. So you get this preferential loss and in inflammation that takes place in these two areas, and you get the subsequent resulting uh, pseudoedema that you see at the optic nerve head. Now, we've also seen this across multiple patients, and this can actually fool you, because if you just get an OCT of the optic nerve head, you can end up thinking that the retinal nerve fiber layer is actually normal. And this normal retinal, so-called normal retinal nerve fiber layer can actually predate the date that the patient comes to tell you to say that they've lost vision. And we showed this eloquently in a, a study of um, patients in Brazil, where we saw that you could end up tracking back the uh, disc edema up to almost eight months prior to the onset of the vision loss. And then over time, this edema resolves, and subsequently you end up with atrophy, but it can take up to six months before that atrophy starts to show up. So it's, not, it's possible for these patients, as you heard earlier, to end up being diagnosed with functional vision loss because somebody looked at their nerve, it's looks kind of okay. They looked at their OCT, it was normal. They looked at their visual field, which is a subjective test, they weren't seeing so well, but they thought that this patient was faking it. And that's an unfortunate consequence of this disease phenotype, because it gives you very few objective measures to be able to say there's a problem. Your ophthalmologist was so dependent upon looking at an RAPD in a patient who has optic neuritis, but if they have bilateral vision loss, there's not going to be an RAPD. So it takes out things from our tool belt that we're used to using. One of the things that can be very helpful, and you heard a little bit about this earlier, and thanks to Pio Bovoni in Italy, who was able to demonstrate that you get gradual loss of the ganglion cell layer over time. And again, this loss of the ganglion cell layer seems to predate the onset of symptoms according to the patient. So we know that things are happening before the patient actually notices there is an effect or a problem. One of the other things that can be quite helpful is to also look with a red free light. And when you have a look at with red free and a patient with labors, even though the nerve fiber layer is still considered quote unquote normal, you get an almost complete dropout of the nerve fiber layer between the superior and inferior arcades corresponding to the papular macular bundle. And so looking for this clinically can be an objective sign that you can notice in a patient who has labors. So some of the other things that um, Labor noted were that these patients typically lost vision in both eyes. Well, we know and we've talked a little bit about how a patient may not notice when the first eye got lost and then they subsequently lose vision in the second eye and then they complain about the vision loss and finally see an ophthalmologist. But there are also case reports in the literature to be mindful of, of patients who went 41 years in this case from a case from Andy Lee. Uh, there's another case for a patient who went 18 years and there's a case of a patient who's been followed for 50 years who only lost vision in one eye and the second eye still remain normal. So it's kind of interesting that you've got a disease that is synonymous with bilateral vision loss, yet some patients don't lose vision in the second eye. And it's not entirely clear what's happening here and what's causing it. One of my patients ended up losing vision loss in one eye as a result of having an attack of optic neuritis in that eye. They also had MS and Harding's disease. And then subsequently, when they got an attack of optic neuritis in the second eye, which was over a decade later, they ended up losing the vision in that eye. So predisposing and precipitating events also account for why you may get some changes that happen in one side or another. Um, reactive oxygen species don't know whether to turn right or left. So it shouldn't matter, but it seems to. And how that matter and how that uh, interplay takes place we don't fully know yet. The other thing that um, Labor mentioned was that you end up having this disease of young men. And you've already heard a little bit about this study where we looked at about 1,500 patients who were affected by Labors. And we found that there was actually a three to one ratio male to female. And it is also interesting, as indicated earlier, that you had a one to one ratio once you started to hit the age of 35. So in the older population, it didn't matter whether or not they were male or female, the chances of them um, becoming affected were equal amongst the two groups. So you have this clinical syndrome, you've got this clinical phenotype, early profound color lots, uh, central scotoma, papular macular bundle um, dropout, corresponding temporal pallor of the optic nerves, and usually bilateral symmetrical vision loss in both patients. 
this clinical scenario leads you to doing the genetic testing. And sure, you do the genetic testing, but it's important to realize that while most places will only look at the three most common genetic defects, there are up to 35 other genetic defects that can also cause labors and are believed to be causative in this disease. Now, some of these genetic defects don't just cause labors. So it's important to realize that as well. And looking at these different genetic defects, as well as realizing that there's actually a case publication in the literature now of an autosomal recessive mutation that gives a phenotype equivalent to labors. So there's a lot of interplay taking place in these genetics beyond which, um, some of which we don't fully understand. You've already heard also about the importance of looking at the MRI images. I have a young gentleman who unfortunately was diagnosed with optic neuritis in one eye. Subsequently, he was thought to have optic neuritis in the second eye when the second eye was lost. He ended up undergoing not only uh, high-dose IV steroids, he got IVIG. He also got Plex therapy at the Children's Hospital about three times and went through all of that to ultimately end up being diagnosed with labors. Uh, nobody really clued into that, and largely they got led on a red herring chase because his nerves were lighting up. And so it's important to appreciate that um, you can get these T2 signal changes in patients who have labors. One of the other things that I find quite helpful is using electroretinograms. When you have a patient who has loss of the, um, of the ganglion cell layer, there are ERG tests that you can do in order to look at that. And you can see a reduction in one of the components here that illustrated the photopic negative response of the full field ERG, which corresponds to patients who are affected. In addition to that, you, uh, there's a distinction cut off at about minus 20 in the paper that we published that showed that there was a distinct difference between the controls and the affected. Interestingly, some of the carriers also had a reduction in their photopic negative response. So there's something going on there in the ganglion cell layer that we don't fully understand. And it could be that these patients are waxing and waning over time. That um, sense of the pseudo edema, for example, also waxes and wanes. There's a patient that we follow down in Brazil that we've been seeing for about the last 25 years with Dr. Sadun and uh, Dr. Corelli from Italy, who had pseudodiscodema 20 years ago. He still hasn't lost vision. So we don't fully know what all of these signs and features mean, but they are clinical clues that allow us and help us to make these diagnoses. And ultimately, what you want to do for these patients is you want to be able to understand, demonstrate that they have an organic loss of vision. You want to get that genetic test done. You want to do the imaging and other studies that you want to do in order to rule out other diseases, as you should. Um, but you also want to be able to counsel them and advise them on what they need to do. Patients who have lost vision as a result of labors, as you heard, are more susceptible to losing further vision as a result of continuing to smoke, continuing to drink. So even after they've had the effect of conversion, they can still continue to lose vision. And it's important to keep that in mind and advise our patients accordingly, because if we don't do that, they're gonna end up far worse off than if we had intervened. So, if you're okay, I'm going to move on to my next topic, which is LHON therapy and management. And so we've already heard about how complex one becomes affected in patients who have labors. And part of that is because if you had a mutation of complex two to complex four or five, it would be fatal. And we wouldn't see individuals who have that. And you know about this overflow of these electrons creating reactive oxygen species. And these reactive oxygen species subsequently can be scavenged by quinones um, and taken out of the system, which is one of the uses of quinones. But in addition to that, quinones also have an ability to come in, take these reactive oxygen species and reinsert them into the electron transport chain. So that can help increase the amount of ATP that's being produced because the electron transport chain then becomes more efficient, but it also recycles the quinone. And there are three generations of quinones that have been used to treat labors. CoQ10, which unfortunately has relatively poor blood brain barrier uh, penetration, idebinone, and epi743. Now, the data for idebinone comes from two papers, one which were published back to back in Brain. The first one was a randomized, well-done uh, clinical trial. 
The second one was a retrospective study that looked at data of patients over a number of decades. And the ROTO study actually failed to meet its primary outcome measure. It ended up showing that you did not get an improvement in visual acuity for those individuals who are on idibinone versus those who are on placebo. But it's important to remember that these patients were not homogeneous because the mutations actually did not divide equally amongst these two groups. This took patients who had all of the three primary mutations. In addition to that, uh, when you look at the patients who deteriorated, those that were on placebo had a higher incidence of deterioration versus those that were not, and that was statistically significant. Note that the numbers are quite small here. You're talking about six patients in one group and two in another. So it's kind of hard to know whether or not this is truly meaningful. When you have a look at some of the other secondary outcomes that they looked at, you had an improvement in visual acuity in those individuals who had discordant visual acuities at the beginning of the study. And you also had an improvement in the number of patients who went from off chart to on chart um, in those patients who were treated versus those who were on placebo. So some of these clinical outcome metrics seem to suggest that the drug was actually doing something and working. But it's always important to take post hoc analysis, which is typically retrospective, uh, with a grain of salt. Yet there's additional evidence when you take a look at the other paper that was published in that same journal from Dr. Corelli's group, where they looked at 103 patients who had up to five years of follow-up. They were able to show that those who were on idibinone, particularly the ones who had the 11778 mutation, did better over those five years compared to those that were not taking idibinone. So there is strong evidence to suggest that idibinone works. Now, it doesn't work for everybody, and we don't fully understand why. There may be other genetic factors that determine whether or not a patient is going to respond to idibinone, but it's important to realize that this is currently the only therapy in the world that has been approved for the treatment of labors, and it's approved by the European Medicines Authority. And they looked at this data, they evaluated it, and said, we don't have anything else. It's not toxic. It doesn't cause much uh, problems for these patients, only rarely do patients run into issues with hepatotoxicity related to their continued drinking and alcohol consumption rather than um, just solely being on idibinone. We also have to adjust the dose to account for that in children, but it's a relatively safe medication. We don't have another option. We agree that you need to use it. They also mandated an ongoing um, phase four study to be conducted, and that is continuing. Uh, the company is also uh, going to the US FDA with additional data that they have collected in the United States. Now, Epi743 is a much more effective version of idibinone. Essentially, it has better um, blood-brain barrier, barrier penetration and is more effective um, by about a factor of 10 in terms of um, tissue cultures as being a reactive oxygen species scavenger. And there was an open-label study that was uh, conducted in LA, Brazil, and Italy, and I was one of the investigators on this. It's a 10-year open-label trial, and the results are very similar to idibinone. The interesting thing with this study and with some of the idibinone data is that patients started um, kept improving even five to six years after they converted. So all of these patients were treated in the acute phase, but they remained on therapy for a prolonged period of time. And subsequently, they started to show vision improvement in the third, fourth, or fifth year after they've been on therapy. We can't fully explain that. The other thing is it doesn't entirely match with spontaneous recovery because we expect that to happen closer to the first to second year. Elamiputide is another agent. Um, it's um, being done, used as part of a clinical trial in LA that I'm part of, um, and that is being um, done by a company called Stealth um, Biotherapeutics. And it, this is an agent that helps stabilize cardiolipin in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And this is thought to help stabilize the electron transport chain and allow better function of the vision, uh, sorry, a better function of the um, system and reduced uh, reactive oxygen species production. So when we looked at this data, again, we had placebo in one eye, it's an eye drop, and then subsequently treatment in the second eye. We got very similar results for both eyes over the initial um, 
year, uh, two years of the study. Subsequently, they went on an open label extension and patients continued to show some recovery in visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, mean deviation, as well as mean deviation of the central points of the visual acuity, which improved more than just the total mean deviation calculation. The other therapy that we need to talk about is gene therapy, because that's one of the hot topics right now. And you can't mention gene therapy in labors without talking about John Guy, who unfortunately passed away last year. John Guy was a, a clinical investigator at uh, the University of Miami um, and was at Baskin Palmer. He was the one who pioneered the idea of using gene therapy in order to treat this disease. And the concept behind using gene therapy is on the basis of creating a vector and in this case, you're putting it in an AAV2 vector um, where you place the normal gene for the ND4, in this case for 11778, with a mitochondrial targeting sequence in front of it, put it inside the vector, inject it into the eye, and then allow the machinery inside of the eye to transfect the AAV going to the nucleus of the cell and subsequently producing the uh, protein product that gets transported into the mitochondria and hopefully ends up replacing the defective uh, ND4 gene in the mitochondrial complex one electron transport chain. There are several groups, including John Guy's group, a group in China, and then the GS10 group, which is sponsored by GeneSight in, Italy, uh, in France, which have been looking at this therapy. The GeneSight study is probably the largest of these, and I am, again, a clinical investigator, a co-investigator of this study. And they initially did a phase two, uh, two phase three studies, one looking at patients less than 180 days, so less than six months from the time of onset, and those going from 180 to 365 days, so within the first year of onset of the disease. And what they found, which was kind of interesting, was that not only did the vision get better in the eye that was treated, but it also got better in the eye that wasn't treated. So the question became, why is this happening? And we still honestly do not have an answer. They also subsequently did a second study looking at um, treating both eyes. And again, the patients in this study, both eyes ended up getting better but why it was it that they still, the improvement was almost equivalent to that of the sham injected eyes from the first study. So there's still debate in the literature right now as to why this is happening. Could it be because the patients are getting an improvement in their visual processing occurring in the occipital lobe, which is possible? There's an argument as to whether or not the uh, virus is crossing over to the other eye some way somehow, which seems a little unusual given that the concentrations required to, uh, to have an effect that are being injected in one eye, you probably would expect a thousand fold decrease in, crossing over at least to the other eye. Um, so it'd be unusual for you to get a direct gene effect in that eye. But it's important to note that regardless of whether or not the patient was um, treated, the improvement seemed to happen. And the improvement happened more from baseline in those patients that were treated. So there is potential that this medication is actually doing something in these patients. We don't just don't know why. So Part of the challenge with this is if you look at the natural history data, which is the green line in this chart here, all of these patients did better than what you would expect for natural history. So is this medication doing something? We don't entirely know. And we still don't know why the fellow eye is involved. But the natural history data here also has some challenges in it because most patients, if you go back before we had um, treatment options and clinical trials for labors, were basically seen once, told, oh, you have this disease. Unfortunately, I can't really do anything for you. Um, here's the name of a low vision specialist. Go see them. And we never really followed these patients with a great detail with the technology and the studies that we have available to us now. So we don't truly know what the natural history is of this disease. And if you have a look in the literature, there are actually only three prospective studies that look at natural history for labors. One of them is um, based upon the Brazil cohort that I mentioned earlier that I'm involved with. And if you looked at a meta-analysis that was just published last year, 
um, by Nancy Newman and Valeria Corelli, as well as Patrick E. Y. Mann. They did a meta-analysis and found that there were only 12 retrospective studies, three prospective studies, and a total of 695 patients. So not a large number of studies. Retrospective studies typically missed multiple data points. Patients may, may be seen twice over a period of five years, which was the inclusion criteria. But you did not have that granularity or uh, patient-level data, which also leads to the question is, are patients actually learning to how to do better on our eye chart? If I took you and stuck you in a room and made you check vision for patients day after day after day, you would remember the chart, and most of us do. We don't look at the eye chart anymore. We know what the patients are going to say because we know what the order of the letters are. And if we repeatedly start testing our patients every month, which is what happened in the gene therapy study, you could end up with an unintentional learned effect. So it's important to actually look at other things beyond just visual acuity, and those other things are becoming more significant now. So just to give you a little bit of a disclaimer before I get into the next part of my talk, I practice in Canada. So my clinical um, guidelines and what I follow, which I'm going to go through now, are a little bit different than what you might experience in the Middle East. And typically, my goals of clinical follow-up are to follow the patient clinically, understand what's going on with them, help them, treat them if they are eligible for clinical trials, get them involved in idebinone, as well as discuss their psychological and, and mental well-being. We typically um, see both carriers and affected patients because I think there is a role to be played in um, helping carriers understand the disease and avoid those toxins because it's already better to prevent them from becoming affected than trying to treat it afterwards. And we ended up seeing them um, doing the standard clinical tests that we've all talked about now. Um, we get the eye vitals, essentially the best corrected visual acuity, the intraocular pressure, the GCC layer, the RNFL layer, and we get all of that for all of our patients. In addition to that, we also get electrophysiology because we find that quite useful in being able to track and understand these patients over time. So in terms of follow-up, we end up seeing the carriers and when they convert, we end up seeing them on a monthly basis at least because we end up wanting to not only get those eye vitals, we talk about getting an EKG for them because of the co-existence uh, of cardiac conduction deficits. We counsel the patients on um, what to avoid, what they need to do, how behavioral modification can help them, prevent them from getting worse over time. We go over treatment options. Are they eligible for a clinical trial? If they're not eligible for a clinical trial, is there, uh, are they able to get idibinone? What are they able to do in terms of what's available? Uh, we try to make connections also with organizations organizations that are responsible for people with low vision, because it's important for them to get plugged into that system, because that can help them in terms of their ability to function and their ability to do things. The other thing that we take into consideration is that over the acute phase while they're converting, the different requirements for the patients change over time. And some of them will start asking for paperwork to be completed because they need help with getting a computer for school. They need help to be able to sit at the front of the class. They need help with somebody who's going to help them take notes so that they can com complete their university degree. And these are all things that we end up getting involved in over time and we get to know our patients quite well. And then in the chronic phase of the, um, the disease, we actually end up still seeing them largely because we have to also keep into mind that they can get other eye diseases. Optic nerves that have had an attack of labors, had an attack of optic neuritis, have very thin retinal nerve fiber layers to begin with, are going to be more susceptible to other diseases, including things like low tension glaucoma. So it's not uncommon to end up having patients who later on in life start complaining that their vision was stable for 20 years, but now all of a sudden it's starting to decline. And if you have a look at the back of the eye, they're starting to get more cupped than what you had seen them 20 years earlier. So it's important to make sure that you treat that and treat them aggressively because they don't have a very strong nerve fiber layer to be able to survive even normal pressures. Most of my patients end up on idibinone, largely because that is the only therapy that's available right now outside of a randomized clinical control trial. And if you look at the international consensus um, statement on this, it is essentially recommending that they be treated for one year uh, from the time of onset if they are seen in the initial uh, at conversion. I encourage my patients to consider it, even if they haven't had uh, been treated within that one year, uh, simply because we don't know. I also talk to my patients about whether or not they want to continue it beyond that one year mark. If they, some patients find that they're getting an improvement, they decide they want to continue. Other patients decide they're not getting an improvement, but they want to give it a longer shot. Others say, it didn't do anything for me. I want to stop. It is a safe medication from that perspective, so I'm not so concerned. But if they want to take it, by all means, I um, encourage them to consider it. 
The other thing that I talked about is also psychological well-being. And in that aspect of it, it's important to realize that these patients have profound vision loss and they can suffer from other things that other patients with profound vision loss can have, including being seeing um, odd things and strange shapes and Charles Bonnet syndrome. And it's important to recognize that we as physicians need to recognize this and talk to our patients about it because they're very scared to tell us, I saw a bunch of bunny rabbits jumping across the white wall um, in my room, in my house. And if you have a look at um, a study that we just did, which is in press right now, when we asked patients and went through diagnostic criteria for Charles Bonnet in using a validated questionnaire, of the 100 patients who ended up having Charles Bonnet, only uh, less than 5% of them have actually been told by a healthcare professional they had Charles Bonnet syndrome. So it's something important to keep in mind. So remember that these are complicated patients, they're complicated diseases. We just need to be able to figure it out over time. Sometimes um, retrospective is 2020. But at the same time, be mindful of the patient, be mindful of their well-being, be mindful of the carriers and their family, because ultimately you are physicians, and we have to help them in different ways, depend, depending on different times. Uh, thank you. And I'm not sure if you'd like to pause here for questions, if you'd like to go into the cases. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lassum, for, for this very informative and updated presentation about the uh, early showing. Uh, if you have uh, some clinical cases, we can go for it now. Uh, after that, I think Dr. Wright also will, ha will have one case he can, he wanted to present also. Sure. So this is my first case. This is a 17-year-old uh, young lady who came in to see us. She's medically free. She ended up coming in complaining of having lost vision in her right eye in May of 2019. And then by October of 2019, she subsequently lost vision in the second eye. She had uh, been treated for an upper respiratory tract infection three weeks prior to the vision loss in the first eye with amoxicillin. And she was on OCPs, um, but she had had delayed menarche till the age of 16 because she was really very actively involved in sports, but had no other medications and had no other medical issues. She had a family history of a maternal uncle who lost vision at the age of 24, and he was a professional musician at the time and was spending a lot of time drinking heavily and smoking in nightclubs. And so the question became, was this possibly something um, beyond just your typical NMO optic neuritis spectrum uh, issue or anti-MOG? And indeed, it certainly seemed to fit with that. And her visual acuity when we had seen her between the first and second eye becoming involved was 2070 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. She had reduced color vision in the right eye and was seeing 16 out of 16 color plates in the left eye. She, had been, she was sent off to get her genetic testing done, and as I mentioned, we not only test for those three primary mutations, but we also test for the other mutations through uh, whole genome sequencing. Some places will end up doing the, first, the three primary mutations first, and if it's negative, consider doing the full genome sequencing. Our lab does the full genome sequencing. It's just dependent on which lab you happen to use. And we found a mutation, the 14568 mutation, which is not a common mutation associated with labors, but has been shown to be causative in the literature. It was interesting also that her mother was tested and she actually had a, a heteroplasmy of 77%. Our patient was nearly complete homoplasmic for this mutation at 99%. So the question became, what do we do? She has a rare mutation. She's got a rare clinical mutation that does not allow her to participate in any of the clinical trials because even the clinical trials using idibinone are looking for patients who've got the three primary mutations. She has a rare mutation, which there is no clinical data really on. There are only three case reports of this uh, mutation in the literature. It has been shown in animal models to be causative, but at the same time, we don't have a lot of clinical data to say what to do. But we have the option of using idebinone in this case, and we did encourage our patient to um, start idebinone, and she started it within seven weeks of the onset of the first eye loss. Uh, we were still waiting for the genetics to come back at that point in time, but we thought it was important that given the family history and given everything else, that she get involved in, in getting, um, starting on idebinone because everything was pointing to labors as being the diagnosis. Her vision continued to progress. She continued to lose vision for over the first year. And this is something that's quite common. And we've seen also in the Brazil studies where the patients, regardless of whether or not they stabilize or get spontaneous recovery, they continue to lose vision over the first year. And they reach an adherent at about 12 to 18 months. 
And then subsequently, she ended up um, coming back to see us uh, at the two year mark and then everything's been spaced out quite a bit because she doesn't live in Ottawa and um, everything got shut down because of COVID as I'm sure it has in other places so travel wasn't exactly easy over this time period, but she slowly gradually over time started to recover. And if you have a look at the back of her eye, you can still see this drop off the retinal nerve fiber layer in the temple quadrant she's got temple uh, almost complete cupping and loss of the nerve fiber layer there. And uh, she ended up having an RNFL that confirmed that in both eyes, almost complete temporal loss, thin retinal nerve fiber layers at 53 and 65, ganglion cell complex layer completely gone, 51 and 55 microns. And then when you look at the visual field, she's got diffuse vision loss and a very dense central scotoma. Uh, unfortunately, a foveal threshold was not on here, but the remarkable thing was her visual acuity was 2020. So despite all of this damage that took place, her vision had recovered back to 2020. And at the two year mark, when we subsequently saw her, the, visual, the scotomas had shrunk. She had fenestrations in different areas where she was able to see through, and she was back to 2020 in both eyes. Color vision was significantly improved back to 14 out of 16 in the right eye and 16 out of 16 in the left eye. So we have progression from the initial, when we saw her at the six week mark, when the right eye was only involved, the worsening of vision, the nadir, as it's so called, um, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and nadir is always going to be the lowest point, and then subsequent visual recovery to 2020. The other thing that we looked at was the electrophysiology for this patient, and as you can see here, the pattern ERG between the initial onset and then subsequent um, result was actually recovered. It declined over the in midpoint, and the photopic negative response looking at the ganglion cell response declined over time, the most recent test being the one at the top here. Now, I mentioned she's got this rare mutation, right? And we know that some mutations are more prone to having spontaneous recovery compared to others, particularly the 14484 mutation. Now, this is also a mutation in um, the ND1 gene. So it is possible that this mutation can end up influencing um, having a higher rate of spontaneous recovery. We just don't know. So how much LHON played a role in this, we're not entirely clear. Uh, 14484 can have spontaneous recovery reported in the literature up to 71%. So could this just be a case of spontaneous recovery? The other issues are she was quite young at the age of conversion, which increases the likelihood of recovery. And she had a reasonable optic nerve side, not particularly large, but these also play into the role of spontaneous recovery. The interesting thing, though, is in the literature, the two cases that are published, one was in a 16-year-old male who was 2200 at two and a half years, so had no spontaneous recovery. And the second one was in a 42-year-old male who unfortunately died, but had visual acuities at the 2500 to the 2250 range at less than one month. Uh, one year. So we don't have a lot of data, but there is a possibility that uh, idebinone did something for this patient. So it's important to consider it, even if the patient doesn't have one of the classical mutations, because it can be helpful. So young age of conversion, use of idebinone, she didn't smoke, she didn't drink, and she did remarkably well. She's never going to be a fighter pilot because she has those central scotomas, but at the same time, her vision and her function is actually really good. She does not drive because in Canada, she doesn't meet the driving standard, but she can have a pretty full and functional life, um, and she's currently in university. It's also important to recognize that she is a female patient, and typically females actually do worse when they have are affected. And having a female affected in a pedigree actually increases the likelihoods of males being affected in the pedigree. So overall, she's done remarkably well. I just have one other short case, if you don't mind. I'm just going to go over that. Um, so this is a case which is a little bit different. It's of a 16-year-old male who ended up complaining of difficulty of reading. And he initially was given prism glasses by his optometrist who said that he's got convergence insufficiency. Use these prism glasses. It'll help with your vision. He had amblyopia from a childhood, so he was 2060 in the right eye and 2025 in the left eye, which makes having convergence insufficiency a little bit unusual for somebody who's got amblyopia. Two months later, he ended up waking up and he couldn't move his right eye. He could not ad uh, duct it. And the vision was unchanged in the eye at the time. He ended up going to the emergency department, ended up getting uh, an MRI scan. He was diagnosed with a right internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And the MRI demonstrated this increased signal in the posterior aspect of the pons and brainstem.
and there was no post-GAD enhancement. He was diagnosed with having demyelination, intravenous uh, methylprednisolone was administered, and he ended up receiving IVIG. And he got moderate improvement of his INO, but he still ended up having some double vision. Eight months later, and because of this double vision, he, rem he was patching his right eye. Eight months later, he noticed when he took the patch off, the double vision was better, but he couldn't really see from the right eye. And he was now count fingers in that amblyopic eye. Uh, he was also 20-30 in his left eye, which was decreased compared to where he was before. He denied any pain with eye movements, and he subsequently came in and was evaluated. And this were his, his eye movements at the time. So bilateral INO with some downbeat nystagmus. And he ended, went to a whole series of metabolic and other panels. He ended up having a lumbar puncture, which was normal. He ended up having NMO testing, which was negative. Uh, Anti-MOG testing was also done, which was negative. He had in repeat imaging, and that showed that the area that was involved previously had this high lactate peak, and he was subsequently diagnosed with Lee syndrome. Now, Lee syndrome is basically an uh, encephalomyopathy that can occur in typically in young children. It usually happens in the first to second year of life. It's unusual for this to happen to somebody who's almost 16 years of age. He did have lactic acidosis, hypotonia, uh, uh, dysotonia, ataxia, and nystagmus, and ophthalmoparesis. But it's extremely unusual presentation for this to happen. Respiratory failure is the most common cause of death in these patients, and they usually don't survive beyond five years. So again, unusual for this to happen. And it's associated with mitochondrial diseases, uh, mitochondrial mutations in the ATP6 gene, which is responsible for ATP synthesis, as well as uh, nuclear DNA mutations in SURF1. But our patient's genetics came back with 11778 mutation, and none of the other causative mutations associated with Lee syndrome were present. So we have a situation here of a patient who has LHOM plus, with LHON uh, type uh, mutation, which is causing a Lee-like syndrome. Now, there are several other fe clinical features that can happen in patients who carry mutations in the mitochondria. And these include tremor, dystonia, migraine, which happens at higher incidence in patients who have LHON mutations, thanks to the data from Dr. Corelli and Dr. Lamorgia in Italy. Uh, seizure disorders, Lee-like syndrome, which we've just demonstrated in our patient, which has also been published in cases of uh, 3460, 14484 as well. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, and Dr. Sudun's demonstrated that the brachial plexus of patients who have um, LHON is affected. Uh, myoclonus, cerebral ataxia, cardiac conduction issues, of which we've already heard. And all of these things happen in various degrees in patients who carry these mitochondrial disease mutations. We've also um, heard about other mutations like 14459, uh, which is more associated with spasticity and dystonia, causing a phenotype that's very similar to labors, or 3697, uh, which again is associated with causing MELAS, but has been shown in patients to demonstrate just the clinical phenotype of labors. So again, we're going back to phenotypes. We're talking about a disease presentation, right? We're not talking about the genetics. The genetics are all intertwined. And these mutations can cause different diseases depending on what the background genetics are in these patients. And we heard a little bit about Harding's disease and LHON with MS. And it's important to realize that these patients who have LHON and MS end up having a worse course of MS. And the uh, interaction, it seems to happen at more than just associated with chance alone. So our patient ended up having the fundus that you would expect to see in a patient who had labors, but also had Lee syndrome. And they had the vision loss associated with labors with dropout of the retinal nerve fiber layer in the papillary macular bundle. Subsequently, they developed respiratory failure. They were intubated. They were able to come off the intubator, thankfully. The visual acuity at discharge was 2400. And then subsequently, when we saw them in clinic, they ended up having improvement in the visual acuity in their better eye back to 2060. Uh, they still had ataxia, their ocular motility had improved, and um, they were actually enrolling in university. And we subsequently haven't seen them since because they moved to another uh, location for that. But LHON is not just a vision disorder. It is a spectrum disorder. You can have multiple different uh, phenotypes based upon the genetics associated with it. And idibinol may be helpful not only in the classical mutations, but also in those non-classical mutations that we sometimes see.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rustin, for this excellent presentation. Uh, Dr. Raid, I think he has a, a short case also he wanted to present. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I, I just want to share this case uh, uh, my seen recently. This is an 18-year-old boy who presented with a bilateral sequential loss of vision. He had vision loss in the left eye in July 2019, and then the, the, uh, uh, the other eye in October 2019. But no other neurological symptoms. His past ocular history was unremarkable, apart from history of strabismus, children, and childhood. Uh, family history, the, his mother reported that two of his maternal uncles had poor vision of unexplained uh, reasons. MRI of the brain was normal. He had a BEP done, which, was, uh, which showed reduced amplitude, and his multifocal ERG was reported as quote-unquote normal. So his visual acuity was 2400 in the right, counting finger in the left. There was no afferent defect. There was a bilateral dyschromatopsia. His uh, fundus exam, apart from probably some mild pallor on the left side, maybe, but was otherwise normal. And this was his visual field, which shows bilateral dense central scrotomas. So, and this was the OCT, which is probably not the best for quality OCT, OCT but you see that there is some thinning there, the uh, nasal and the superior neurofibular layer on the left side. Um, the right eye was normal. I've seen him four months later, and by that time he got a labor genetic uh, mutation and analysis, and he had the 10663 uh, genetic mutation, which affects the uh, ND4 subunits of complex one. And uh, despite that, that, that there was no evidence that this adivinon was uh, effective, or in the trials, the, this mutation was not included. So we did start him on uh, idibinone. And I've seen him uh, fall on fall uh, four months later. And this was his visual field on the right eye. Uh, Follow-up OCT showed further thinning of the uh, neurofiber layer on the left and uh, also in the right eye. And I've had recent phone conversation with him. Uh, he's been on I've been on for at least eight months, and his mother had told me that he did not uh, notice any improvement, and he was reluctant to come back for uh, another follow-up visit. Now, I, met, I did mention this case because I have seen the recent publication by Dr. Karanija that this area is void. The, <laughs> there is no uh, work done probably on labors. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned this case because we did some work a few years ago when we uh, sequenced a large family of three generation, and we did find actually this mutation along with a concurrent other mutation. So essentially there were two concurrent uh, genetic mutation which have been associated with labor and a large pedigree here in Kuwait. And uh, I had a chance to examine uh, six of these uh, cases. And uh, you notice that the, the age uh, range is generally what you expect in a classic labor uh, patient between 15 to 20. And uh, most of these, some of these patients at presentation did not have the typical uh, fundus appearance that we usually associate with labor, which is disc edema with microtelangiectasia. And just to emphasize that what you can get is either normal disc or optic nerve pallor and at presentation. And this was even before the age of Ida, before I'd have been on. So I had to start them on coenzyme Q10 at that time. And one of the patient actually was a smoker. Um, so he had another risk factor uh, uh, for, for, for uh, manifesting the disease. So I just wanted to share this case. Uh, it's a very nice case series, and um, I do apologize that we had no data from uh, your part of the world, but part of that was because the study was based upon English language um, self-reporting. So unfortunately, we didn't have um, any Arabic speakers as part of our team to be able to get some data from your area. Um, it's also interesting to note on that last slide of yours that the patient who was smoking had the worst visual acuity. Yes, true. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Dr. Rai. We have some questions uh, from our attendees. Uh, Dr. Majid, uh, he is asking, Dr. Rustum, uh, he has a question. Uh, if, if there is a limitation of genetic testing, how we can confirm the diagnosis? Like if the patient present, he has a typical presentation of, uh, of uh, early join, uh, uh, loan, uh, you know, and uh, uh, also there is a family history with or without family history. So to, can we go for treatment with these patients even uh, there is lack of testing, genetic testing? So I do that routinely, largely because genetic testing, uh, even though we have it available, can take several weeks to months to get it. Uh, the results because the government uh, has decided that they'll collect a whole bunch of them and then only run it every two to three months, depending on how many case um, requests that they get. So we typically will start the patient on idibinone um, or encourage them to start it. It's not approved in Canada as a medication, so they get it as a supplement from the U.S. Um, and it's uh, it's their choice. We go over the data with them and tell them what the benefits, potential benefits are. I encourage them to start sooner rather than later. Uh, consensus guidelines also indicate that the, the earlier you're able to start, probably you're going to have better outcomes. So uh, if there's a typical family history, typical clinical history, toxic nutritional, optic neuropathies, and all of those other things that we talked about have been ruled out, then I would encourage them to start, yes. Uh, also, there is another question for you also from uh, Dr. Uh, Dania. Uh, she's asking about the adjusted dose for edibinone in pediatric. So the Dose for idibinone in adults at nine, uh, 300 milligrams three times a day is probably way more than what they actually need. And so what we typically do in pediatrics is we have a look at the size of the individual and we do a weight adjustment um, based upon that 300 milligrams TID dose. Uh, some of my patients, uh, pediatric patients also have difficulty with swallowing so they can end up powdering at the idibinone. Um, we have a few compounding pharmacies that will end up doing that for them and they just eat it on top of their cereal or whatever else they happen to be eating at the time. The other thing to note with idibinone, it's also useful for patients to take it with a little bit of fat because that increases absorption. Um, and we, so we ask them not to take it on an empty stomach and we also get them to take some vitamin C uh, about 500 international units once a day. Uh, that'll keep idibinone in the reduced form and allow it to remain active in the body for a longer period of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Rustum. I have a question for Dr. Luai. Uh, do you think, uh, Dr. Luai, that any patient diagnosed with uh, LHON, uh, uh, we should go for cardiac and neurological evaluation for every patient? For younger patients, I, I, I would say that uh, I send patients for cardiac evaluation and it's, I usually send them uh, for 24 hour uh, halter. Uh, for uh, and the second question, I'm sorry. Yeah, for cardiac and neurological evaluation. So every yeah. patient we should go for and Neurological, unless the, there is something that I see during the clinical visit, I would send them for neurological evaluation. So for my patient that who has uh, who uh, had a tick, uh, the young girl, had a facial tick that they thought that it might progress to dystonia, but it was just a, a, a transient tick. Uh, but this is a patient who required a, a referral to a neurologist. But I would say usually for patients, uh, younger ones, especially I would send them for cardiac evaluation. It's good to know from Dr. Bahbahani and uh, also Dr. Uh, uh, Rustum, what do they think about that? Uh, Dr. Ross, uh, Dr. Bahbahani, uh, what do you think about this? Is that every patient uh, should go for cardiac and neurological evaluation or just uh, selective patients? Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to this. I mean, we used to do, we used to do it for every patient. However, the yield of finding anything uh, in terms of is, is pretty low. And some of the cardiologists would just... Um, um, you know, show their amazement at sending some of these patients. So uh, I'm not sure if there is any clear criteria by which we can go in, in order to screen some of these patients. Um, you probably want to do it in cases of LHON plus, or if you have evidence of systemic involvement, uh, mitochondrial, uh, to see it in, is in isolated LHON with just optic neuropathy. Um, I'm not sure if even there have been studies that show the frequency or the prevalence of finding cardiac abnormality in LHON with just eye optic nerve involvement. So maybe Dr. Rustum can comment on that too. 
So some of the original studies and the original data that linked cardiac conduction abnormalities to patients who had labors were done in specific pedigrees from Northern Europe. And so it's not uncommon for a pedigree to have cardiac conduction abnormalities. That's a fairly common disease. Um, and it would therefore be not unusual for you to get overlap between a rare disease and a common disease. Um, if you look at other pedigrees, for example, a pedigree in Brazil that has almost 400 members in it, cardiac conduction isn't an issue there. So it really seems to be pedigree dependent. Um, so if there's a history of cardiac issues in patients in that pedigree, I would certainly send them. Uh, some colleagues will advocate that you should send everybody, just get an EKG on them just to make sure they don't have Wolf-Parkinson-White. But I don't see a high yield either um, from doing that. And so definitely my plus patients, I will have them checked. And anybody who's got a family history of having cardiac conduction issues, I would end up getting them uh, assessed as well. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rostum. Uh, there is a question from uh, uh, Russia. Uh, what about the online sources of IDB known? Is it trusted? So I don't know we can answer this or not. So I'm not sure how easily is uh, IDB known available in the Middle East? So uh, I would maybe answer from my standpoint. Uh, yeah. We do this exactly the same thing that I think you're doing for your patients. We just provide them with uh, some websites from the US and they get it shipped uh, to yeah. uh, to uh, where they live. So this is what we've been doing uh, for our patients. But recently now we have IDBN available. So things might change in the near future. Okay. So we still don't have IDBN available. And when we go back and look at the patients that we've been treating with the supplements, we haven't seen a detrimental effect. So presumably the purity levels and everything else um, seem to be equivalent. Thank you very much, Dr. Rustum. Thank you very much, Dr. Raif. Thank you very much, Dr. Luay, uh, for all attendees also. There is also, uh, just uh, please, uh, we have one survey. We have a survey that we want everybody to share us just to improve uh, our meetings. And uh, there is anything just to add in the future meetings. Uh, I, have, I, ho I hope everybody share us this survey, uh, which will be shown now. Uh, I hope everybody show us. Uh, join us uh, to answer this survey. Uh, I want to announce also uh, for uh, 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 our next uh, meeting, it will be a webinar on uh, uh, leper hereditary optic neuropathy on 13 of December. Uh, I hope everybody join us at that time. And uh, there will be invitation and everybody will be invited. Invitation will be sent to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, my speakers, colleagues, uh, and uh, for all attendees. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.